remarks. Uh, I'd like to just add a couple of points to what you've said. Uh, on January 6th, Senator Ted Cruz described it as terrorism. They later came to attack him during their revisionist uh, Orwellian Stalinist attempt to rewrite history. Unfortunately for them, we know that there were 147 or 48 of our officers who were wounded, bloodied, and hospitalized by the uh, rabid mob that beset the Capitol that day. We know that Kevin McCarthy, one of their deposed leaders over on their side, called Donald Trump from his office to complain about how his people were storming the Capitol and putting people's lives in danger. And Donald Trump said, no, no, those aren't my people, those are Antifa. And McCarthy corrected him and said, no, those are your people, Mr. President. To which Donald Trump said, well, maybe they just care a little bit more about who won the election than you did. Kevin McCarthy. You guys have got to deal with reality here. By the way, the speech and debate clause stands for the exact opposite principle who our distinguished new member uh, uh, just spoke about a moment ago. It says that members, that members of Congress Mr. cannot Chairman, be questioned Mr. anywhere Chairman. else other than Congress. So Point he should privilege. read the speech or debate Mr. clause Chairman. aloud. Let, 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 him, let him finish his sentence there. Now, Chair recognizes Mr. Burchett from Mr. Tennessee Chairman. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my colleagues seem to want to talk about the justice system, so let's talk about it. November of last year, the chairman issued a subpoena to Hunter Biden to appear on December 7th, uh, December 13th, excuse me, for a closed door deposition. Instead of respecting the rule of law, Hunter Biden chose to give a press conference on the front steps of the Senate. To, so, to, to show such contempt for Congress without fear of repercussions highlights a theme throughout this administration and Democrat administrations before it. If you're a big name Democrat, then you are immune to prosecution. Former Attorney General Eric Holder said as much in a memo he wrote regarding collateral consequences. For those who don't know, the collateral consequence policy allowed prosecutors to consider whether charging a company or individual will result in greater societal harm than not charging them. It's why the banks weren't held criminally accountable to the fallout of the 2008 financial crisis. It is why Jeffrey Epstein's clients aren't behind bars. It's also the mindset of President Biden and his family, too big to jail not too big to fail, too big to jail. The two-tier justice system is a disgrace to our country and the principles it was founded on. I thank the chairman and the committee for the hard work they put in to hold the Biden administration accountable, but I doubt our Justice Department has the guts or the wherewithal to do anything about it. And I would like to yield my time to my friend from Florida, Byron Donalds. Actually, Are you actually Ms. I'll yield. Yeah, yeah, yield uh, let, me, let me yield to Miss May. She hasn't gotten enough quality well, TV time no. today, so I'll give her a little more time. Uh, thank you, and then I'll yield to my colleague from Florida. I'm going to try to be quick here because I was accused by my colleague on the other side of the aisle about my white privilege. I want to say, number one, as a former ranking member of the Civil Rights Subcommittee under Chairman Raskin last session, I take great pride as a white female Republican to address the inadequacies in our country. I come from a district where rich and poor is literally black and white, black versus white on most days. My largest jail in my district, which is the largest jail in the, sta jail in the state of South Carolina, has had seven or eight deaths in the last two years. And I was there with our black and African-American council members trying to get the right thing done. And I come from a district where black men have been killed by law enforcement, tased to death in our jails. And I've stood with those black families because I know the differences that they see day to day in their life. And I try to do the best that I can. I come from a district where the first African-American, first black man in the U.S. House of Representatives was Joseph P. Rainey, represented my district back in the 1800s with that. The last black member of the U.S. House of Representatives before Reconstruction came from South Carolina, George P. Murray, the, the, the black man, former slave and entrepreneur who founded the Republican Party in South Carolina. One of the founding members was named Robert Smalls, who commandeered a, a Confederate ship and gave it to Union soldiers and served his country admirably in the process. In my district, it was Harriet Tubman. And you can see it in the movie, movie Harriet, who rescued more than 700 slaves in one night in Beaufort County, South Carolina. So I am very well aware of our rich history and try to recognize it as best as I can in the position that I have. And I resent the fact that you're gonna throw that in my face up here. I'm one of the few people that you'll see on my side of the aisle trying to do the right thing to the right people every single day. And I would like to yield the remaining uh, balance of time to my colleague from Florida. 
Uh, this has been a very interesting hearing. Mr. Waltz, welcome to Oversight. Yes, it usually gets like this. Uh, look, let's be very clear. This isn't about Hunter Biden's white privilege. It's about Hunter Biden's Democrat privilege because Donald Trump Jr. showed up for five congressional subpoenas. There was never this circus where he was subpoenaed by House Democrats and he showed up on the Senate side or showed up at the White House to answer in some fake, phony, lame press conference, not actually going to the House and doing what he was compelled by a subpoena to do. Hunter Biden did that. And then he has the unmitigated gall to show up here when we know that he's, we're going through actually the, the legislation for contempt with, by the way, Mr. Chairman, we should actually get to the legislation of contempt. The speechifying is great, but let's do our business members. Um, he has the gall to come here, show up, and then when the Democrats are saying, hey, he wants to speak, he leaves. This is a joke. This is a farce. The man has been subpoenaed by Congress. Oh, and by the way, the January 6th committee, Mr. Raskin, which you did sit on, by the way, that was not a normally ordered committee of Congress because Nancy Pelosi did not want the Republican members that's, that then Leader McCarthy put up. According to the courts, it was. I, we, my time, sir. Will you yield for I, a, no, I a correction? I was respectful of your time. I didn't say anything. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's move forward with our business. He should be held in contempt. There was a subpoena. He did not answer it. Any other American will be held in contempt by Congress. Any other. This is Democrat privilege of the highest order. Let's do our jobs. I yield. Gentlemen, yields. Chair now recognize Ms. Ocasio-Cortez from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to address briefly, um, quickly, that, that moment about uh, privilege and, and all of this that we're seeing here. Uh, it was a very beautiful speech uh, by the gentlelady um, who, as she mentioned, was uh, helped lead on the majority, the now majority side, uh, the Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Subcommittee. But I think it's so exemplary of the point that she also oversaw the elimination of the Civil Rights Subcommittee on this committee, which really kind of gives the whole game away. We show up, we give speeches, we give flowery words, but at the end of the day, participate in the structural erosion of the rights and representation of people uh, that, that are marginalized, women, people of color, people that just need to see their due process and civil liberties protected in this country. But I will move on. As also the Republican side had mentioned in their many uh, raisings of the January 6th committee, that it's not just Hunter Biden, you, me, any individual subject uh, to, to equal treatment under the law, to be held up to accountability under the law, but it is also these committees and this committee that is subject to oversight and law. We must comply with the law here as well. Now, I may be one of the very few people that actually believes in Congress, you know, in this country. But I do, and many of us do here. And we have an obligation to engage in good faith participation to execute and comply with a subpoena. The chairman said in front of the country several times to Hunter Biden, you can show up here in front of the world, in front of the public. Hunter Biden took him up on that offer. He said, I will show up in public. I will show up in public. He showed up here today. He showed up here in the past. And Mr. Chairman, I know you do your best with what you've got, but you've got members here that have submitted falsified evidence to the record. You have members here that have submitted and mischaracterized closed door hearings. And people wanna say back and forth at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what party it's happened from. You've got members who've engaged in revenge porn in this committee. So it is understandable why Hunter Biden would want to testify in front of the public for the American people to be able to witness that testimony uh, it, uh, for themselves. You've got members who've defied subpoenas. You've got members who we are um, one year into the term asking what the rules are at the beginning of the committee, the book was given to us on day one. And so what we should do is allow the man to testify. I believe in the power of the oversight committee. Frankly, I believe in it regardless of whether Republicans or Democrats have the chair, because I believe that this committee should have the power of oversight. And we cannot do that on a partisan basis. And so for that, I implore this committee to allow Hunter Biden to testify publicly. 
I implore and I ask for that to happen. And we cannot do that by getting engaged in this back and forth on a, on a defiance of the subpoena. Let him comply. Let him do it today. Let him do it tomorrow. But let the man do it. And with that, I yield back to the ranking member. Thank you, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. I think you went right to the heart of the issue here. Um, you know, if this ended up going to court, Mr. Chairman, and I hope it doesn't, I really hope that this committee will act in a way to negotiate and, and uh, achieve a compromise with the witness. But if it goes to the court, it's going to present a novel question. What happens when a committee represented by its distinguished chairman goes out in public and repeatedly invites and challenges a witness to come before the committee, and then that witness gives the answer, yes, I will come in. At that point, the committee pulls a bait and switch and says, well, we actually don't want you to come before the full committee as was offered repeatedly in public by the chairman, but instead, we'd like you to come to a back room and do it there in a closed deposition. Now, undoubtedly, if that had been the original offer, the committee would stand in a very good place, the way we did with Mr. Biggs and Mr. Perry and Mr. Jordan, because they were told to come in, they were subpoenaed, and they blew off the subpoenas uh, of the committee, which is why I don't think anybody should be voting on that side other than Ms. Mace, because Ms. Mace is the one who took the position that the rule of law means something. And I take the position, if we give somebody a subpoena, they should come in. But there's a very, there's a very sticky problem now. What happens when we give them one offer A and then switch it over to offer B. That's why I hope you will work it out, Mr. Chairman. Thank and, you for yielding. Uh, gentlelady's time's expired. Uh, to respond to the gentlelady, he can come in for a hearing after the deposition. 